The landing site chosen for Apollo 17 was the remote Torres Littrell Valley, a gorge deeper than Arizona's Grand Canyon. It would be a tricky landing. The sun would have to be in just the right position for Cernan to find his way down between the mountains. For that reason, the last manned flight of a Saturn V rocket would have to launch around midnight. Author Andrew Chaikin was there. It's the only night launch of the Saturn V, and I will never forget that as long as I live. It was like the sun came up in the middle of the night. I mean, the light from the rocket was this beautiful golden orange color that just turned night into day. With Ron Evans monitoring things from orbit, Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt got ready to take Lunar Module Challenger down to the surface. It would be the final lunar landing of the Apollo program, and Cernan wanted it to be the best. Keep coming down slowly, slowing it down, slowing it down until that little wire down there about eight or nine feet below the lunar module uh, that's hanging off of one of the landing gear touches something. A blue light comes on, you shut the engine down. And then you, you know, your stomach goes, for that one half second, stomach goes up and you come down. The reason you have to shut the engine down before you actually touch the surface is because if you don't, the back pressure in your engine might very well explode and, you know, ruin your whole day. So you, you have to shut it down and, and fall that last uh, six or eight feet. It was the same for every crew. Once they landed, there was a moment in the silence when every astronaut thought about what had just happened. You can climb the highest mountain and walk the deepest ocean on this planet of ours, and it's still Earth. But I was walking, no longer floating in space, but walking on another body in our universe that was not Earth. I was really here, I was really on the moon, and that is really the Earth, and that is really a quarter of a million miles of space between me and, me and, me and home. Uh, it, it, you know, and you could stick up your hand and you could, you could blank out your identity with reality uh, with nothing bigger than the palm of your hand. It, it, it's, it's a, it's a, a, a moment, maybe a philosophical moment, but a, but a moment in time that you have to try and comprehend and absorb rather than just allow to pass. As I step off at the surface at Taurus Littrell, We'd like to dedicate the first step of Apollo 17 to all those who made it possible. In retrospect, uh, I, I have got to say that Jack did an outstanding job on a flight, uh, both on the lunar surface and in the spacecraft, he knew the systems. Uh, he and I eventually worked very, very well together. Jack would come in and kind of zero in on the details and Gene would see the big picture and they really complimented each other. Um, Gene spotted a lot of good stuff and um, had a, just an amazing amount of energy and didn't quit, you know, they just kept going and kept going and kept going. You know, if it was a question of operational considerations and, you know, safety and all that stuff, Gene was in charge. If it was a question of we've got to get that sample, you know, he listened to Jack a lot and um, held his own. He was not just, you know, Jack Schmidt's field assistant. He was a, a real partner in that exploration. Cernan and Schmidt effectively swapped roles on the moon. The scientist was so focused on his many tasks that it took the pilot, the last of the NASA cowboys, to remind him of where he was. Sometimes I had to tap Jack on his shoulder and say, hey, take, take one moment, time out. Even the geologist on the ground, who were just so focused on what Jack and I were doing up there, said, Gene, thank you for, for grabbing a hold of Jack and saying, time out, Jack. Just take a look at the Earth for one minute and absorb it. Take 60 seconds of your time on the moon. I mean, he's comfortable on the moon. He's bouncing around, you know, hippity hopping over the hill and dale, you know. And Jack Schmidt is Jack Schmidt and making puns. And it was just wonderful. It was like, uh, these guys are, out at the edge of human experience and they're having the time of their lives. I was rolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May, May's a 
Hey, that's right. Hey is the year of the month. Cernan and Schmidt's three-day adventure set up instrument stations and experiments that are still delivering data. Cernan was also able to make the first interplanetary auto repair. Cernan had accidentally knocked a fender off the lunar rover, making it kick up so much moon dust that it was impossible to drive. After checking with mission control, the astronaut did a quick roadside repair substituting the cover of one of the many manuals as a replacement. And then, suddenly, it was over. Three days of living in a cramped tin house and driving to work in a peppy little sports car were done. It was time to come home. I mean, I stood in sunlight surrounded by blackness, blackness. This can only happen within nature itself. I looked out and focused beyond the Earth, and I focused on the endlessness of time and the endlessness of space, the thing called infinity. I can't put it in my hand. I can't draw a picture of it on the wall, but I can tell you it exists because I saw it with my own eyes. And all we did was come back with a lot more questions than we did answers, and then we quit. Project Apollo was finally over. Despite public indifference and government cutbacks, the designers, engineers, and dreamers had accomplished the impossible. They'd made the moon a viable destination and brought every crew back home safely. NASA had opened up the future. The question now was, did the space agency have any future of its own? <laughs>